Am I on? All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve. I'm an event leader with SMC. And tonight, I want to talk to you about ropes, particularly their design, use, and purpose. I'm probably going to be looking at this a lot because there's a lot of information here. I put it this way so then uh, anyone here or viewing online can digest all this because it's quite a bit. So I will try to get through it as quick as I can because uh, it's about 45 pages worth of information here. But I have some demonstrations as well. So the humble rope, what purpose does it serve in the mountains? Uh, it's personal protection equipment. It protects us while climbing. Uh, tethers two or more individuals together in a closed system. And offers a lot of latitude in our mountain travels, a lot of stuff that we within the club actually do, uh, such as repelling, fixed lines for expeditions, which is where the Prusik and those auto blocks come in handy, uh, running belays, simul climbing, terrain belays, where we weave the rope around different rock, rock features in case someone were to fall, it can help protect us. Actual pitched belays, such as multi-pitch rock and ice climbing, uh, short roping, and makeshift rescue and safety systems, haul systems, lowering systems, and multi-point anchor systems. Also facilitates high angle mountain rescue and makes our climbing photos look pretty, just like this one right over here. So the rope, uh, the modern Kern mantle rope, uh, the Kern is the core, the mantle is the sheath. And I actually have right used in my picture here. This is what it looks like. I will end up passing this around so you can take a look at it. The core is actually not one singular element. It's comprised of anywhere from three to 20 core strands. And those strands consist of three twines each, which are in a tight helix such as this one right here. And when you further break that down, they're actual yarns, which are the consist consistency of dental floss. And those are weaved together to create the twine. You break that down even further, and you have the filaments, which are these little, little hair-like, you can see it in the light, these little hair-like features. And that is the most singular element of a rope core. And usually in here, they try to keep a tracer, as you can see by this little red piece right here. Uh, didn't particularly intend for it to break off, but that works. Uh, usually, the manufacturers will choose a different color every year as a way of identifying uh, the year manufacturer of the rope. This one happens to be red. And on the next slide here, we have uh, the sheath. And the sheath is usually not going to be have any tinsel strength specifically, but it's designed to protect the core. And it will be weaved from anywhere from 40 to 48 carriers or bobbins, which will braid it together around the core. And it may consist of a uniform two-color design, such as in this picture here where it's a light blue and a dark blue. Or it may consist of anywhere from five different colors and very unique designs, such as like on this rope. And those two consist of yarns, which are the, the actual full element here circled in red, which are braided together, just like how on these, the, um, the yarns are thick bundles of filaments. And then you also have the filaments with individual strands of nylon. So it's a very stacked system and how these ropes are built. And also, as you'll notice on most ropes, they're going to have some sort of identifying label at the end, which is going to have information about the type of rope they are, the usage and application, the diameter, and even the serial number for some manufacturers. I know Petzl and I believe it's either Beal or Sterling also put serial numbers. Not all do, though. But at the very least, the label is going to have an EN892 specification, which I'll be mentioning later, but that is the UIAA specification for a dynamic climbing rope. So you want any rope you buy to have that specification on it. If it doesn't, it shouldn't be used for climbing. And as far as ropes, there's three different flavors here. There's single, half, and twin. And I imagine most of us out here have used the single rope system, which I'll demonstrate right here. 
we'll pretend that this is our little setup of protection here. That a climber on a single rope system is going to clip through like this where it's single rope through each piece of protection. Now, the trouble with that is it's not redundant. So we have other methods here, which are the half and the twin ropes. The way to remember them is twins have to stay together. So in the twin rope system, they are designed to both be clipped to the same pieces of protection like this. And this is much more redundant. So, uh, particularly, we like to use this in trad when we're dealing with sharp rock or particularly with ice climbing where you might have a cramp on or an ax hit one of these ropes. So it's good to have redundancy. Now, there's also the half rope system, which you essentially alternate. So we'll clip on that rope and maybe we'll clip our next piece on that rope. And then maybe on the next piece, we'll clip our other line. So it can look kind of like this. And where this is very helpful are on traveling routes where there's a lot of winding. So you can keep rope drag to a minimum because that could affect your fall factor or potentially damaging the rope. And it is also a redundant system. And as you'll notice, uh, these single ropes are much thicker than these half and twin ropes. You'll notice that the half and twin ropes are almost like a cordelette. They can be about eight to nine millimeters. The single ropes can be anywhere from about 8.9 to about 11 millimeters. This one's a 10.5. And what's actually interesting uh, is that for half ropes, they're actually rated such that you can have a follower on each strand. So if you're climbing as a team of three, you can have one follower essentially top roped on each strand. And what's nice about the half and uh, twin ropes is that they are also allow full length repels. If you use a single rope, you can only use half the length. So that's where in alpine situations, the half and twin systems are great because of your full length repel option, especially if you have to bail out. The less repels, the less amount of gear you leave behind, so the more money you save. And I decided to use emojis to describe this. Um, for dynamic ropes, and the single ropes in particular, there's going to be pros and cons to each sizing. Generally the workhorse 9, 9 to 10 millimeters to 11 millimeters are going to be quite heavy. Durability is going to be excellent. They are pretty much bomb proof but handling can be a little tricky because they're, they're so fat. Sometimes they can be hard to put in a blade of ice or can be tricky to tie knots. As was shown in the last presentation, the rope is so fat that sometimes you can't cinch down the knot very well. Uh, then you have the all-arounder ropes, which are sort of the 9.3 to 9.8 range. And most people you will find, at least for their personal ropes, will probably have something in this range if they're using anything outdoors, particularly for trad, alpine, ice, snow, or even top rope. Uh, the handling is usually great on these. They're usually known for being very supple ropes. Durability, that depends on your usage. I pretty much tore up my first rope. And uh, weight is much better. Uh, usually it can be a couple pounds lighter, so it's much more friendly to take in long backcountry situations. And then you have 8.5 to 9.2 range of skinny ropes. Sometimes we call them snow string, choss floss, ice floss. Um, or my favorite is the dynamic cordelette because usually they can be confused when they're size with a cordelette. Uh, they're not very durable, which is why we like to use them in pairs for redundancy. Uh, the weight, they are super light. They are like carrying one of these little static lines that we use. Um, the handling though, as I've mentioned, these little surprise faces, there's a particular reason for that is because I will show, demonstrate here. 
when you're in a multi-pitch situation and you have an anchor set up where you're belaying off the anchor, you're going to have your climber side on top. Now I'm just showing one strand here just for simplicity. Normally it would be two strands. So normally when the climber climbs, you're going to pull on the slack so that when they fall, they're not going to go anywhere. What can happen with these thin ropes is if you look at the diameter based on the tube device, like an ATC, the trouble you'll have here is sometimes under extreme weight, this can flip and the climber strand will go underneath and then they'll be in free fall. So that's why with skinny ropes, you have to be extremely careful with them, with both handling them and with making sure the device you use with it is within specification. But otherwise they're exceptional for handling. It's just remembering the safety factor. And as far as dynamic ropes, they're usually offered in sizes ranging from 30 to 70 meters, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Um, sometimes you can get them 80, 90, not so often anymore. One cool thing to be nice about that is we get to later is if your rope gets damaged and you have to chop part of it, sometimes if you get an 80 or 90 meter rope, you get a little bit more life in it because you haven't chopped down to below what the normal range would be that you'd want. Uh, the important thing is to know the beta of where you're climbing. And I've listed a few examples. Uh, ham and cheese is a route on Lover's Leap, and it's actually bolted, uh, particularly for anchors. Those anchor bolts are exactly 35 meters apart. So if you're climbing with a single rope and you brought a 60 meter rope, you're going to end up about 7 to 10 feet short of your anchors, and that's going to be an interesting way to down climb to get to them. Uh, Chenard Falls at Lee Vining is a, one of our favorite ice climbing spots with the club, and it depends on the situation, but in most snow years, you will need a 70 meter rope to top rope there. If you bring a 60, you might be very lucky if there's a lot of snow. On the far left, you need an 80 meter rope for that route. The 70 is going to be too short. And Pick of the Vic in Ure Ice Park is a, about a 50 meter climb, and that's a top rope managed site, so you have to lower your climber in. So that's a case where you want to make sure you definitely have the right length rope, because you do not want them in free fall out of the blade of ice. And as you'll notice here, when we're talking about dynamic ropes, do you notice that there's two different colors for the half and twin ropes? What do you think would happen if you use them in a system and you bought two of the same color? Fun, exciting, right? So generally they make these in two different colors for that reason. They want you to buy one of each. And almost all ropes are gonna have a black middle mark. The one on this rope, I'm not gonna try to find it, but it's usually very prominent. It'll be almost like a paint that's, sometimes it'll be about a foot long, sometimes two, two marks. Uh, some brands are more prominent than others. And you'll also have some ropes that are by pattern, where you will see partway through, the pattern will actually change, and that'll denote the middle of the rope. Usually those are more costly, but they're very easy to, easy to use for finding the middle. And dynamic ropes also come in dry treatments. Dry treatments are polyurethane uh, treatment coating to the individual nylon filaments, and it'll help repel water as well as dirt and resist abrasion. Uh, because wet, non-dry ropes can retain approximately 50% of their weight in water and lose about 40% of their tinsel strength. Um, and manufacturers offer very different varieties, such as no treatment, just a dry sheath treatment, which can reduce abrasion by about 40%, according to Mammut, or dry core and dry sheath, which can resist abrasion up to 120%. The reason there is because on a sheath and core, treating, they'll usually do a dual coat system. So it's not the same as just having the core treated versus the sheath treated. It's a whole different method. And it's usually known by different na names, such as Petzl Duratec Dry, Mamu Dry, Edelweiss Super Every Dry, Ever Dry, and Beale Golden Dry. Uh, and right now there's actually a new UIAA standard, which specifies that any that are marked as UIAA Dry can only, are only allowed to absorb 2% of their weight in water. 
So it's a very stringent test. Not all ropes meet that, but those that do are some of the best on the market right now. And on the side here is exactly the situation where you might want to use dry ropes. And a couple of different technologies that some companies use that are different and in their own styles is such as Beal Unicore. And Beal Unicore actually bonds the sheath to the core so that in the case of a sever of the sheath, the sheath doesn't completely slide off. It stays somewhat intact, which allows you to bypass it for rescue or as think of it like a, like a hamster wheel if it doesn't have that, where the sheath just keeps sliding down, but you can't climb up it. Uh, then Petzl has ultrasonic finish, which is actually a finish they use at the end here to bond both the sheath and the core together to prevent sheath slippage. And Petzl Everflex is another one that, just like Mammut, uses a heat treatment before braiding to uh, shrink in and stabilize the core yarns for consistency. That's just some of the many different technologies out there. And these are just a list of some of the manufacturers that make them. And lucky enough for you tonight, Gregor actually sells ropes now here at Bobcats. So if you're thinking about ropes, this would be a great time to ask any questions after this presentation if you're in the market for a rope. So safety standards. The UIAA is the International Climbing and Mountaineering Federation, known by its French name. I'm probably going to completely destroy this. Uni Internationale de Associaciones de Alpinisme. And it was founded in 1932 in France by 20 mountaineering organizations, established to recognize and standardize and strengthen the sports of climbing, mountaineering, alpinism, in the spirit of safe and ethical mountain practices. So their whole idea is trying to standardize what we do and make everyone on the same page with safety practices. And their label was created in 1960, internationally approved in 1965, and globally recognized by 68 nations today. And only mountaineering products which pass stringent criteria, criteria are allowed this logo. So it's not just, uh, you, know, you, buy, you know, you buy the rights to put this logo on. These products have to meet very stringent tests. So now you're probably wondering what exactly do they do stringent tests for? That's just a short list. And over on the far right here are some white page samples of helmets and ice screws. So they're very specific about what they look for, both as far as the durability, the strength tolerances, and the design of certain products. So the ones we're talking about tonight are dynamic rope and static rope. So I'd like to sort of pass these around and these are our static lines here. Do you notice anything that's interesting about them compared to our climbing ropes? They're boring. Yeah, they are. Boring. Well, they're stiff, which they usually are. And the irony is that one's called the um, PMI Easy Bend. <laughs> and it's totally not. Um, but that's right, is that they all are pretty bland looking. They all notice how they have maybe one, two colors of a tracer that spins. That's on purpose. It's a design intention required by the UIAA so that people can identify a static rope from a climbing rope. So they've thought this down to the very core of climbing. So now these safety standards that we're talking about. The first one is you'll see a list when you buy a rope, say, such as this. You'll notice that it's going to have all of these markings on it and all these information, these specifications usually on, a, on the little uh, paper, uh, paper wrapping on it. So I'm going to go down the list here. Uh, dynamic elongation is usually one of the first ones they mark. And it is the amount of rope stretch you get from a UIAA fall. I'm guessing a lot of you who've done climbing, especially on a fresh rope, and you've taken that first fall, how far you actually fall back. I've climbed up sometimes up to about 15 feet and taken a lead fall, not a lead fall, but a 
top rope fall and my feet landed right back on the ground because it was a fresh rope which had not been used yet. Uh, so it's considered the maximum elongation due to, due to extreme test standards, which I've actually show on the right here is a graph plotting the dynamic elongation of a rope during a fall. And even top rope falls will wear down a rope, uh, not just lead falls. And static elongation, on the other hand, is just weighting something on the end of a rope, just hanging it, just dead weight. In this case, 176 pounds or 80 kilograms, because that's what UIAA specifies. So I'm sure it's kind of a cheat, but what are some examples of where we might have static weight? Hint. Hang it. On yeah. A, like while you're projecting. Exactly. Let go and just hang there off yeah. the roof of a, you know. So hang belay stations, hang dogging, as you specify. Uh, falling while on a tight top rope belay, rappelling, lowering, hauling systems, uh, crevasse rescue, hanging mid-air, or haul bag on a big wall ascent. And on the topic of the static elongation, um, it's going to be much shorter than the dynamic elongation. But what's interesting is the tensile strength of these ropes, this one's about a 10.5, is somewhere around 25 kilonewtons of tensile strength. So it can hold my Subaru static weight easily without breaking. Um, and on the topic of anchor building, I know people can sometimes be sketch about, is that anchor gonna hold my weight? Well, usually a three point anchor with bomber placements that's well equalized will hold about 30 to 40 kilonewtons of force, which is easily the static weight of an SUV. So need not worry that if your anchor's built well and you have a good rope, it's gonna hold your weight. Uh, so now the next specifications are the sheath, math, sheath mass and claimed weight. Sheath mass is the percentage of overall mass that the sheath constitutes of the entire rope weight. Uh, usually it's gonna be anywhere from about 30 to 45% and the more mass the sheath has, the greater the durability. Uh, claimed weight, on the other hand, is going to be the overall weight gram per meter of the rope. Uh, for single ropes, it's usually 50 to 80 grams or so, 35 to 50 for half and twin ropes. But it can be deceiving, and I've actually put that on the far right here based on some weights. And I actually did a fun little test here at Bobcats when I was getting a rope, where I actually asked uh, those who were here, hold on to this one and this one, which one feels heavier? It happened to be that the one that was determined as heavier was the 9.2 rope. that felt heavier, not the 9.5. And as you can see here, interestingly enough, with these specifications, Mammoth's Attorney 9.8 weighs as much as a Sterling Marathon 10.4. So don't always go by claimed weight. Go by what you need the rope for. Because some of these ropes, you'll notice like uh, the Petzl ropes have a not as tight of a weave but the Mamu ropes have an extremely tight weave, so they look thinner, but they're all using the same amount of materials at the end of the day because of how they're rated. So go by what you need it for, not by the weight. And now the fall factor. The fall factor is going to be the distance fallen divided by the rope available to catch said fall. So I have a few examples up here. And generally, there's a couple baseline ones you need to know. The factor one fall is going to be falling back to your belayer. So you will either deck if you're on a single pitch and hit the ground, or you'll be saying hello to your belayer because you're hanging right next to him now. Uh, on the other hand, a fall factor greater than one means you have fallen below your belayer. This can only happen in a multi-pitch climb. A fall factor two is considered the worst possible scenario. That means, all, that means there is no piece of protection above the belay. All the rope has fallen and the, the belay anchor is taking all that weight. Uh, so you want to protect the belay at all costs with successive gear placements that are good because each one will exponentially reduce the fall factor uh, and as well as more rope within the system will allow for a shorter catch. So place good, good, good gear early and often and a climber is usually considered well protected after their third gear placement. I would say that 
anyone who's climbing conservatively and making good placements should not get anywhere close to a factor one fall unless you're in a run out situation, which you'll notice some routes such as Snake Dyke on Half Dome is rated 5.7R. The R is referring to run out, which means you have no option to place protection. You have to accept that there's gonna be a run out and a high factor fall. Uh, so here's visualized what it might look like. This, design, this graph is courtesy of Petzl. Uh, they had a really great picture. I looked at a couple different ones. So what's particularly interesting is that the middle one, that doesn't look like a factor fall, a factor one fall, does it? The blayer, the blayer and the climber are not back in the same place. Remember we were talking about rope drag earlier? Well, the thing with rope drag is it can have a tendency to pull some rope out of the system so that the effective rope length that's gonna catch a fall can be much shorter which is how you might get a factor one fall when there is a lot more rope in the system. So that's where it comes to placing good protection as well as keeping rope drag to a minimum. So for the UIAA fall test, which is usually the most specific item on the list that people are concerned about because you think, okay, it says five falls. Does that mean it can only fall five times on that rope? No, not really. Uh, a UIAA fall is defined as a factor 1.77 fall with 176 uh, pound metal, metal mass. The falling distance is 4.6 meters and the rope available is 2.6. So if you do the math, 4.6 divided by 2.6, you're gonna get a factor 1.77. The test is, this test is repeated. It's set up with a piece of metal guided on rails, almost like an elevator shaft. They will repeat this test until the rope breaks and it must meet, for any rope, minimum five falls. Uh, half ropes are very similar, but they use a 55 kilogram mass. And what's interesting about the metal mass drop is that it can be 70 times, 70% 70 more severe. Does anyone have an idea why it might be more severe than say climbers? Well, our, our bodies are kind of rubber in a way. So is our catch when we're belaying. Those little things in the system, those idiosyncrasies, create, um, create a softer uh, fall factor situation because it's not so rigid. It's not a piece of metal that's guided by rails that's on a very tight system where the belay is really cinched off like a Grigory would be. So in many cases, the UIAA fall factor, even though it's a 1.77, can be far more severe than a real life factor 1.77 fall. So the clinical worst case scenario is really about as bad as you can get as far as what they call a UIAA fall. And those you would have to take, in example, this rope is probably five to six UIAA falls. You'd have to take five or six of those type of falls for a rope to con be considered uh, retired. So don't worry too much about your little falls on top rope or when you're lead practicing in the gym on your top rope, not on top rope, but on your lead line. Those kind of falls are not severe enough to damage a rope. So next we have the impact force, which is the catch quality. And I've actually showed a picture on the far right of one of actually Mammut's uh, drop tower they use for the UIAA test. It is an old elevator shaft. Um, so the kilonewton is a unit of gravitational force and it's equal to about 225 pounds of force. So the impact force is the maximum force transferred from the rope mass to the mass tied at the end of the rope at the apex of the UIAA fall. So at the apex of dynamic elongation, when that fall happens, whatever force is being applied to the climber or the piece of metal at the end of that is what's called the impact force. Most ropes you're going to find somewhere about 8.5 to 9, uh, but 12 kilonewton is the absolute maximum allowed because of old U.S. military spec, which stipulated that a paratrooper could only withstand up to about 12 kilonewtons of force when their parachute deployed. So that's been the baseline. And um, that's where I mentioned again, actually, the tensile strength. Um, so then kind of the last one here, common kind of oddball, is sheath slippage. 
usually we don't ever see this unless we intentionally make it happen with our old ropes that we're kind of messing around with. But it's the shear factor in measured in millimeters that a sheath slips from the manufacturer alignment to the core, uh, which you have to think about, uh, which is why I mentioned earlier these ends are closed and sealed to prevent that from happening. Uh, sometimes severe falls can do that on a rope, especially if it's a rope that you've already had to cut short. And the sheath slippage actually is shown in this picture here, creates some bunching. It's actually on the bottom half of the picture where you see it all kind of wiggly. That would be sheath slippage, kind of like taking this, sort of. Bad, bad example, bad example. Slip, slip just a little bit. Back example, I should have actually trimmed that end off, then it would work a little bit better. Um, so the UIAA EN 892 standards test uses an apparatus to surface load the sheath of 2,230 2, millimeters, don't ask me why that number, of section of dynamic rope. And a tolerance is allowed up to 20 millimeters. Almost all ropes have zero though. Uh, there are one or two that I've heard about that do have some minor sheath slippage. I'm not sure if it's by design or what, but, or if it was a flawed one that was reviewed but that's just what I've heard. About 99% out there have zero. So now we get to what the actual specifications are, the 892 standard. And this is them right here. I'm not gonna read out all the details. You, you online will certainly be able to see this as well as those here. All ropes that are given the UIAA approval and sold on the market have to be within these ranges listed here. So now that we've kind of looked at all these, let's look at a couple examples. This would be a workhorse rope, kind of like this one. It's the Mamu Gravity 10.2 project. And now, does everyone kind of have a better sense when you're looking at these stats now, now that you've broken them down, these kind of make more sense probably about what these mean, the dyna dynamic elongation, static elongation, the amount of falls they can take. You can see how a workhorse rope can take 11 to 12, which is, quite massive. And I also put the price down on there because I think it's important when people are thinking about ropes, uh, just how costly these things are. So I put the MSRP at 70 meter lengths for all these examples. This is the Petzl Aerial Dry uh, 9.5. This is a common uh, all arounder rope that people use in Alpine and ice. This is the Beale Ice Line 8.1 unicore. That's more kind of like these. Um, those of you online can probably see better. These are a very pretty baby blue and a very pretty pink. And what's interesting is you have to be very careful about buying half or twin ropes because some manufacturers like Mamu will rate all of their uh, partial system ropes, both half and twin. Some like Beale only rate certain ones twin or half. So based on the application, that's something that you would want to be very aware of. And sometimes you can use one half of this system as a glacier travel line if you're on snow or uh, glacier travel situations because such high friction coefficient of falling that will slow you down naturally that you don't need to have a fat rope which could take a vertical fall. And the one thing to remember is $249.95, that's for one side of the system, one strand. So that's, this is where ropes can get very costly. So now this is the Mammut Twilight 7.5 dry, also the same situation where it's used as a system. So coiling a rope, you'll notice that most ropes you buy are coiled either drum coiled or lap coiled. Th this rope right here that I'm using an example, the Sterling rope, this would be drum coiled, which means that it's basically on a big drum coiled in a giant loop and then kind of squished together and tightened with some final loops. The trouble with this is if you don't, if you don't uncoil it the first time properly, you can get a lot of kinks in the rope that can take a lot of time to get out. And if it was your friend's rope, they might not be very pleased that you did that. Uh, so I'm not going to demonstrate that, but I have the instructions here where you generally find the middle mark of the rope 
um, then hang a bite off that off your arm and use your hands kind of like this to uncoil it and let it drop to the ground, sort of mimicking the reverse motion of how it was coiled at the factory. And then you'll feed the rope through your fingers, applying pressure just to st straighten it out a couple times, kind of like this back and forth from one end to the other. And then you might even go so far as to use a carabiner, hang it somewhere and do the same thing. Pull it through from one side to the other, maybe about four times or so. And now the rope is ready to climb with. And then you'll find other ropes which are coiled like that. They look a little bit more like a mess when you get them in the package, but they're lap coiled. Uh, Mamu and Petz will do this specifically. Um, it's a more complex process, but your rope is ready to climb with. All you do is let's say this is a lap coil. You take everything off of it, it's ready to climb with. Uh, there's nothing special you have to do. You just take off the wrapping and it's ready to feed right into a setup. You don't have to even flake the rope out necessarily. Most people would want to, but it's ready to go as is. Um, and the fun fact is, remember that Munter hitch from the previous presentation? Um, you might not make very many friends if you do that to someone's rope all the way through because a Munter hitch, while great at what it does, it does add a lot of kinks back into the rope. So something to be aware of that the moon tour is usually just an emergency situation that you want to use that. Um, and as far as coiling a rope, um, on the go, butterfly coil is the most common. And it looks generally something like this, which has been partially uncoiled, where you will take to coil it up you can take one end or both ends this is the method I like to use where you put it under your thumb behind your shoulders and then you reach under from one side and pull that entire strand back over reach under again pull it back over reach under and you keep doing that until you have all the coils except for a couple feet hanging over your head now the fun part happens is where you have to bend over carefully reach from behind, lift all of it up so you have the coils hanging in your hand, just like the photo on here. And then from that, it'll look something like this. Not quite as messy, this one will need to be recoiled after. Uh, but for demonstration purposes, then you would take the standing ends and you would loop them around to cinch this really tight. And then you would girth hitch it on the top. And if you have enough slack on it, you can actually create a backpack out of it where you have it hanging over and you take the two sides that were girth hitched over your shoulders, around your back to catch the rope, then switch hands on the opposite side, pull them and tie them together with um, a square knot. Usually I like to do more like a surgeon's knot version of the square knot because the square knot itself doesn't seem to hold down very well. And you can wear that as a backpack. And now during use and on the go, you can use the Mountaineer's coil, which um, is very much, it can add more tangles into the rope, so you have to be careful. But you loop it, sort of a lasso, kind of around your head. You see a lot of guides that do this. And then you can actually tie it back on itself to cinch down. I'm kind of blown through this because we're down to just a couple minutes left. Um, during use and on the go, the elusive Kiwi coil that we weren't able to demonstrate on the previous presentation uh, won't be able to demonstrate it this time because it is a little complicated, but we do teach it in the crevasse rescue classes specifically. It's a way to carry a full length rope, but shorten it or lengthen it on the go as you need to by simply untying that partial knot, letting some slack out, retying the knot. So you can use it to make a 60 meter rope about 30 meters long for two people. So rope damage. Uh, we never want to be like this guy. Uh, where we're just holding a rope that's been shredded. Uh, particularly not on a route either where that rope is our only option. Um, so how do ropes get damaged? Well, falls, isolated high factor falls on lead, many low factor lead falls, repeated top rope falls, which can be deceiving because you don't think about that, but it, you'll notice the ropes at the gym can get very stiff because they've probably taken 50 to 100 top rope falls per day. 
um, and zipping through belay device can melt them too. I actually have this example I'll pass around, which was uh, part of a club rope, which was melted. The sheath was melted because of how fast it zipped through belay device from a lead fall. And you'll feel the difference compared to any other rope you've used before. And why do you think I have underlying crampons and ice tools as a point of damage? Yeah, there. Yeah, there are some stories. Ac you know, actually, I, I've witnessed about a half a dozen ropes get damaged this season, and most of them had to be retired immediately. For this reason, was because of crampon or ice tool damage. So damage is not necessarily um, a process that breaks down a rope. Sometimes, some forms of damage, such as crampons or ice tools, can immediately be life-ending to a rope. Um, carabiner burrs maybe have a beaner that has a sharp little edge on it, that can tear a sheath right open as well. Similar to like what this guy in this photo is holding. That's how much damage it can do. And um, knots as well can weaken rope strength, especially if you've tied a knot and weighted it. You notice sometimes that the rope can be a little lumpy afterwards. Uh, rope drag as well, we talked about that, especially terrain eating features. A terrain eating feature uh, is maybe a sharp edge or a corner or a little chimney, especially on a top rope situation where that feature will literally eat a rope. Um, I'll actually, I'd like to pass this one around too. This is actually a section of retired rope of my very first rope here. And you'll notice a section of abrasion on it. Uh, that was actually from a rope eating feature. It didn't take much, but except, except two top roping belays that needed, uh, that were no falls happened, but that's all it took just to abrade it. Uh, repelling, very fast or uncontrolled repels can create the same situation as the melting example on the rope. Because the friction generates heat and that will melt nylon. And there's also chemical contamination through storage or improper storage. Solvents, cleaners, fumes degrade nylon, such as gasoline, battery acid, and detergent. Um, and that even means in your car. So if you have an extra battery sitting in your, in your trunk, probably not a good idea to toss your rope in the trunk either. So you want to think about those things as keeping your rope well managed and well maintained. Storage, such as humidity, mold, and mildew, extreme heat or direct sunlight because UV light will degrade nylon, and exposure to the elements, such as not bagging the rope. Um, and then proper care and maintenance not allowing the to rope to fully dry before storage, what do you think that'll lead to? Mold and mildew. Allowing sharp objects or flames near the rope, that's not good either. <laughs> um, and not carefully cleaning an excessively dirty rope. I've seen some ropes which used to be orange and somehow they're brown. I don't think they change color on purpose. And the biggest one is objective hazards. The ones we don't think about necessarily is rock fall directly on a rope, ice falling directly on a rope while we're out doing whatever we're doing with the rope, dirt, sand, and grit digging into the sheath and cutting the nylon filaments like glass. Those little filaments that you saw, those can be cut very easily. Mud can even get in there. Uh, those of you who've been to Auburn Quarry probably know exactly what I'm talking about, when you have to get home and hose off your climbing shoes. Uh, so on that token, never step on a rope. Very important. In the gym, usually it's not that big of a deal, but I personally try to be very, very careful about that and get used to it. Because you never want to step on a rope, especially not someone else's. So what does rope damage look like? These pictures are the best example that I have here. Um, I'll sort of pass this one around too. And this one to the other side that I was looking at. That would be a cut end from, say, a core shot. That one actually was a beautiful core shot made a little earlier this year. Um, you can just see how it'll, it'll just cut right through the rope, like butter. So cuts, tears, and core shot. Um, sometimes you won't even see it all the way cut. You'll see maybe a full yarn of the sheath cut or a partial cut, like on here. Severe rubbing and abrasion. That one that I passed around that's still sort of going around that was my old piece of rope, that's an example of abrasion. Sometimes it can start looking like a carpet. And melting, burning skid marks. 
just like that first example with the melting. And this was actually a very alarming example. Um, a rope of mine actually was damaged very similarly to how this one shows. And what was surprising was this individual looked at their rope, they cut it open, and they found that this little crampon spike that just tore one of the sheath yarns happened to cause 10% of the core to get cut. Yeah. So that's why you have to be very careful with ropes and any damage needs to be carefully inspected. And then this is a severe herniation of core strands. I'm not quite sure what situation would cause this, but it's possible. Sometimes you get bulges, flat spots, or hourglass appearance. What's interesting about this one is this was actually a manufacturer defect, not a problem of use. So always check your rope when you get a new one for that reason as well. So visual tests. How does it look? Beal has this great little chart here of different deteriorations based on the type of damage. Um, any damage that you see as you're inspecting every foot of that rope should be more closely looked at. Uh, you know, sort of like, oh, okay, I'll come back to that and take a look at it again more closely. Uh, the sheath pattern should appear uh, continuous and uninterrupted. You'll notice on the ones that are just bicolor, they're very easy to tell if there's been a disruption because you'll notice the pattern in which it's going to cross your eyes almost. You'll notice it breaks somewhere very easily. Um, but that's part of why these are designed with patterns on them, so you can see if there is a break in there. Um, there should be no white core strands visible, which is why a climbing rope generally does not have a lot of white in it, if at all. Um, so some of the visual tests that you'll want to determine whether a rope is to be retired are if there are fully severed yarns, which I spoke of was the latticing weave you can see. If not the individual filaments are cut like you get sometimes with abrasion, but if an entire yarn section is completely cut, that section has to be retired because when the rope gets tension, what's going to happen is that's going to start unweaving itself. Um, core shot should be a pretty obvious retiring of the rope. If you see that it's been cut, severed, should not be climbing on that. Or if you see a flattening or bulging underneath, or a fusing, darkening, or melting of the sheath. All those examples we've shown, if you've seen any of those, those should be immediate visual tests that something is not right with this rope. Um, and as I mentioned, pilling or snagging of some yarn filaments, as you'll notice on some of these passing around, these just little sort of hair-like things, that's okay, that's expected, that's why the sheath was designed. It's just any major fraying is the concern. And the tactile tests. You know, the first one would be to feed the entire rope length through your hand with even amount of tension to feel if there's anything in there. Any, anything that just, that doesn't feel like just the rope threading through your hands. Anything, any irregularities is the word. And another one is you can do the squish test, which we usually do when we're about ready to cut a piece off of the rope that we don't want to use, when we actually did on that sample rope, where you will feel around You'll notice usually it's pretty firm cylinder, but there might be a point where it squishes and becomes like an hourglass. Uh, you probably won't find it on that rope, maybe by the abrasion spots you will. But you will just feel around carefully with firm pressure to see if it squishes anywhere. If it does, that means those core strands that we talked about, those three to 20 that are aligned, it means something has happened to those. Maybe the twines began to unweave because they were damaged, or they got out of alignment somewhere and are starting to bulge up. Usually that's a suspect reason um, that something has been damaged within the core. And there's also the bite test, which any rope, which is in good, healthy condition, is naturally not going to flatten all the way. You'll notice how it gets a bite like this, kind of like when you're going to jam it into a belay device at the gym. It all, it's always going to have some sort of bite, just like in this photo here. Now the bottom photo, you can actually see where it's flattened. When you do that, you try to do this test and it's almost like a 90 degree turn. That indicates there's also been a core problem. So usually you will do that in succession. You will usually not go through every single inch of the rope like this. It's very time consuming. You can do it if you want. I'm not. But usually that'll be after I do my other tests. Visually, is there a problem? Yes. Do I feel it? Is there a problem? Yes. Then I'll do the bite test. Is there really a problem? Yes or no? So the lifetime of service of a rope, um, you, 
generally a rope which has never been used, never taken out of its package, will last for about 10 years. Nylon eventually degrades, much like you know, the spandex and all of our stretchy clothes that we have, you know, the little waistbands and stuff, they eventually start you know, giving way or the socks we have stop losing their stretch, the same idea. Uh, there's also uh, damage considerations. Some minor damage may take a year or two of life off the rope. Uh, some forms of damage like cramponing, ice tools, or rock can be immediately life ending to that section of a rope. And the other history considerations you want to take into account are the types of falls. Generally, it's a rule of thumb that anyone who has taken a factor two fall will immediately retire that rope. Uh, don't want to take that risk. Factor one falls or greater should generally be monitored according to the UIAA fall spec, which is where a lot of people like to keep some sort of journal or record if they have multiple ropes of how many big falls that rope has taken and when. And generally, a rope should be inspected after every use. After every use doesn't necessarily mean after every single belay, but uh, a comprehensive check at the beginning and end of every day. And um, you never want to buy a rope used. A brand new rope, you know the history of. And generally by law, as I recall, any climbing gear which is load-bearing cannot be returned for that reason. Um, so that no one can return something and someone else buys it and they don't know the history. So even if you haven't opened the package, you'll have the peace of mind knowing that even if the package has not been opened for climbing gear, it cannot be returned. And when in doubt, cut it out or throw it out. A life is worth more than $250. It can be a hard lesson for your wallet, but it's a good lesson to keep. Um, so most of the ropes we have in the club sort of fit in the occasional to regular use, which is means their life is going to be about three to five years. So we keep track of when those ropes were bought and we replace them accordingly. That's going to be a few more years, I think, because we've got some new ones. Um, what's interesting, though, is go by the manufacturing date, not the purchase date. Um, one fun example is the rope I recently bought. I checked the serial number, and it was manufactured an entire year before I bought it. So that can be decent. You don't know if the rope's been manufactured two years so keep that in mind and the aging of a rope this is a good example of what i was talking about with the non-dry treatments all the way to the dry and how much abrasion they can take and a brand new rope will be very su supple smooth to handle excellent knotability and have a slick feeling almost like it's just going to slide out through your blade, blade device it feel, has a teflon feeling especially the dry ropes when you first get them over time the rope will develop a fuzziness that's just mild abrasion from normal use, wear, and tear. Um, a rope near natural end of life might be stiffer to handle, less elastic during a fall, which means your fall will feel harder if you're on a lead. And the rope, even dry rope, will wet out really, really readily. And it'll likely be as fuzzy as a carpet. Um, if you get to that point, you're living dangerously, I think. So where do all good ropes go to die? Well. The first thing is, if you do not have 100% confidence in that rope or that section of rope, it should not be used. It seems very stringent, but you're, we're talking lives here. And you, your option is either to cut out the bad section, as this fine person is making an example of over here on the right, where you could chop it off, put some tape, chop it off, and then fuse it with a lighter. But one thing you have to remember is the length is shorter. So if you cut off five meters of one side, your middle mark is not going to be accurate anymore. So think of that when you're setting up a rappel. If you need to remark it with a rope grade marker, or if you need to cut off both ends to make it equal. This is where sometimes buying an 80 or 90 meter rope can give you more life because you just trim off the couple meters that went bad until you get down to the length that you need. Um, or throw it out. Retire it from climbing service entirely, not to be used even as a gym rope or top rope. Uh, so what can you do with a retired rope? dog leash, which I'd like to thank Carolyn actually for mentioning that one to me. I was not aware that that was a big thing right now uh, for using old ropes for. You can build a hammock. A lot of people build rugs and rope art out of them. Uh, donate it for non-climbing use, such as those uses if you don't make those things yourself. Uh, make a splash of your presentation on the ropes. Or where do you think these practice ropes you used earlier came from? Retired rope. 
And actually, that's a great example of a carpet made out of rope. Uh, so going forward with ropes, the major thing we need to keep in mind, all of us, I think, as climbers, are that ropes are expensive, they're very complex, they're extremely fragile, and they're not easily expendable, especially if we're during a climb, we don't have any other choice. We have to use that rope that we have, even if it, we had to cut it shorter now. And ropes see a lot of exposure to sources of damage, but majority of those sources of damage are human caused or human related. And ropes are the critical, often non-redundant, personal protection equipment that we trust our lives to because most of us use single ropes. So as far as rope etiquette and stewardship to our fellow climbers, it may not be your rope, but it's somebody else's rope. So we should always respect whatever rope that is, is treat it as if it was our own and respect the generally accepted etiquette of monitoring a rope and if you notice damage speak up about it it's very important so that both the owner and anyone else who's associated with that rope is aware because depending on what you're doing your and their lives may depend on knowing this information and using situational awareness especially if you are say ice climbing you have crampons or ice tools be aware that you have very sharp points be aware of where the rope is or where it's going to be and make sure not to step on that rope or not to hit that rope if you can if you you know if, if your own actions cause that damage it's best to speak up immediately and take ownership of that and compensate the owner how they feel is appropriate to make them whole again which could be potentially a fully played fully paid for replacement purchasing the damaged rope from the owner Partial replacement cost based on the depreciated value, say it was a five-year-old rope that you damaged, well, maybe not necessarily fair to pay the full price for it, but for whatever price of what life it has left that was now gone. Or the beer and dinner thing, as some people do. <laughs> it's, it, but ultimately, it should, be, it should be whatever the owner of that rope feels is fair compensation to make them whole again. And, I mean, going forward, trust is the lifeblood of climbing. Don't jeopardize that trust. Uh, if damage happens to your rope or because of your actions, embrace it as a teaching moment. These are costly mistakes, uh, especially if you've had to replace a rope for someone. But if taken to heart, that mistake will not be repeated because you know what that involved and how much that costs and how you don't want to repeat such a mistake. And we're all safer for not making those kinds of mistakes at the end of the day, especially when we're in a climbing situation where we cannot replace that rope. If we're careful, we haven't damaged that rope, so we can use it safely. So in that regard, let's be the best climbers we can be by not taking for granted the rope which keeps us safe every day and brings us home even safer, whether we're on the sharp end. So that is it.